Josep M. Gasson. Am I saying that correctly? <laughs> yeah, you can say Pep. Pep. Hi, Pep. Right, Pep is a researcher at Institute de Ciencias de Mar in Barcelona, uh, with the main interest being planktonic microbe abundance activity and ecosystem effects but has lately specced into functional aspects of diversity, such as links between diversity and ecosystem function. He did his PhD at UAB, but I'm not really sure. It's, I looked up, said it would be University of Alabama at Birmingham. Is no. that correct? No. Okay. Okay. That's why I'm asking. That's Autonomous University of Barcelona. Okay. That is very different. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, and you did your PhD on the microbes of Lake Sisaw. Uh -huh. um, uh, and later on, you carried on as a postdoc at McGill University in Montreal, where you mm -hmm. expanded your scope to more than one lake to work more on microbes in general. But this later on resulted in you working on on oceanic microbes. Mm -hmm. And that's my wonderful presentation for you. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Okay, so then thank you for the presentation. <laughs> thank you for having me here. It's the first time that I do that uh, online, so we'll see how it works. And it's kind of, uh, I mean, difficult because you don't see the, the other people. So you don't, I, I will not be seeing whether you are sleeping or you are, uh, you are fed up with way, what I say and leaving the, the, the presentation and so on, but, but that's okay. So um, anyway, so what I will do is I will I will go through through a presentation um, discussing the prokaryotes that are living on the particles that we can find in the ocean, and I will show you four or five different things, and these four or five different things um, uh, more or less follow follow a line of a, a reasoning line, and you will see that uh, we come at the end with a kind of a conclusion or, or, or hypothesis to, to be tested. And this is uh, basically the work of several PhD students. So I selected things that, that two or three PhD students and postdocs have done in, in the past years. So it's, it's actually more research than a, than a theoretical uh, established uh, fact. It's uh, something that I will show you what we find and, and that's, it. that's, uh, that's uh, still research uh, that is going on. So the first thing that I would like to ask you is uh, try to imagine uh, the microbes in the plankton. This is a typical image that you can find in, in the internet. And, um, and you can see that, that uh, the microbes, which are bacteria, are the, the larger ones, and viruses are the small ones. They are neatly separated into this filter. They are uh, one separated from the others. They're, they seem to be living like in a in a in a homogeneous wall in which they are all mixed, but they are all separated from the others. But the reality is a bit more complex, and this is a, a an artistic representation of of the life in the plankton, and it shows that that it's not true that bacteria are homogeneous. Bacteria are uh, attached in groups. They are uh, uh, around the phytoplankton. They are in hot spots of, of organic matter. There are some that are together. They are uh, uh, competing or they are one is creating the other and so on. And, uh, and when you look at the real images of, 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 of life, then you see that the bacteria are attached to, to other, uh, other organisms making a symbiosis. In some cases, they are, they are one is attached to another one. In some cases, bacteria are attached to something which doesn't have a specific shape, which is this organic mucus that we can find in the water. And you see that the bacteria are on this organic muter, mucus, or this is a fecal pellet and you see the bacteria are all around this fecal pellet. So bacteria are not homogeneous in the plankton. This is another artistic representation of the same idea that bacteria are following organic matter uh, fields that uh, when, when, a, when a copepot is uh, feeding or a cell is dying for, because of a virus, then they all go, go there and stay there around these, these particles. So uh, this is an image that some people put to separate what is dissolved in the plankton, which would be in this side, from what is particulate in the plankton. So these are particles. This is something that is not a particle. 
And you can see that the, this definition is a bit, uh, a bit, uh, uh, a bit untrue. is a, is a definition that is, uh, is uh, practical, but it, it it really doesn't doesn't separate things because microgels and colloidal 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 nanogels are all the way, and even bacteria are all the way across this divide be, between particulate and dissolved. So. If you look at the bacteria, there might be bacteria like this happy blue one here, which is, um, um, we can say that it's free living, that is not attached to anything, but then we can have the, the red ones, which is, uh, which may be attached to zooplankton, to phytoplankton, to these organic mother uh, things, macrogels and TEP and all these things, but also attached to fecal pellets, attached to dead organisms, attached to shells or houses of, of zooplankton, but also attached to sand and clay and, and things like empty diet on frustals. So they may be attached to organic or to high inorganic particles. And even, uh, uh, even more, they may be, uh, uh, we can consider, the, or we can see sometimes that the bacteria may be in groups, attaching groups, or they simply become so large that they become, they, they pass from being free living, which would be the blue, to being attached because as we'll see, they have a larger size when they are large. So I will use uh, these two colors, the, the red to talk about the ones that are attached and the blue to talk about ones that, oops, that's the mistake here that, uh, that are free living, okay? So there are a few questions that, that I would like, like to talk about. The first one is, uh, is, is a little bit of a review of when people talked about free living and about attaching the plankton, how did they separate them? And then uh, we will look at the deep ocean, how different are the free living and the attached prokaryotes. Then we will try to answer the question whether this separation into be, from being free living or being attached in particles has anything to do with the phylogeny of these organisms. So do organisms that are alike genetically are, are ecologically alike too? We will briefly look at the genomes of these two lifestyles. And then at the last part of, of the talk, I will get, uh, talk about moving away from this dichotomy, particle attached free living, uh, um, and, uh, and, uh, and showing how when we move away from this dichotomy, what we can see. And then at the end, looking at the linkages between the particles and the bacteria, the growing particles between the surface and the deep ocean. So I start with that. Uh, people separate free living from attached by using filters. That's the easy way of doing it. Put a filter, those that stay in the filter are attached, those, those that go through are free living. So, but how many people, how many filters people use? Well, before 2012, as we can see all the studies, this is a literature search, all the studies used only two filters. One filter to collect the attach, one filter to collect free living. When we get into newer uh, or more recent papers, I mean, there's more people that use three or even four filters to separate the free living from the attach. And which filters did they use? Well, a whole mess. Most of the people collected the free living cells with uh, 0.2 microns, which is the typical filter that everyone uses to collect the bacteria. But as you can see, people used uh, 0.8 or 1 or 2 or 3 or 5 or even 20, 10 and 20 and 60 and so filters to collect the, what they call attached bacteria. We'll go back into that in a, in, in a moment. So. The first question that I'm, I would like to, to answer is how different are free living versus attached prokaryotes in the deep ocean? Well, whoops, there was a, there's a missing talk, missing. Yeah, there was a missing, a missing, uh, let me get it because there's a missing, where I am. Well, I know it's here. Okay, sorry about that. Just simply. Okay, so how different they are? 
we look at this um, during a cruise. The cruise, uh, it's called Malaspina. So we went around the world. You can see here our route. Uh, several people did that. So no, no one stayed for a whole year in the, in the ship, as, uh, but that would have been a killing a student to do that. And, um, and this is the ship that we were using and we were collecting the, the, the samples. And those were samples taken, mostly all of them at 4,000 meters, so in the battery collision. And we look at the, at the DNA and the RNA. We filtered lots of water. And we, in this case, we had three fractions. So 0 0.2, 0 0.8, and 20. We didn't analyze the 20. And uh, we extracted the DNA. That's what most people do. We did tag sequencing. We look at the 16S because we wanted to know which bacteria were in these different samples. And then we did metagenomics to see what these were, this bacteria were doing in different and different fractions. That's the slide that I was looking for that had to be before. So why the interest on in the deep ocean particles? Well, the deep ocean particles are very relevant because as you may know, phytoplankton capture CO2 from the atmosphere and this phytoplankton um, enter the food webs, zooplankton and so on and so on. But part of the phytoplankton is converted into sinking organic carbon. This sinking organic carbon is used by bacteria. If bacteria degrade the sinking organic carbon, CO2 comes back to the atmosphere. However, those, that carbon that it's not being used by the bacteria, it's actually sinking to the deep ocean where it's uh, buried in, either in the sediments or simply uh, left in the deep ocean for a lot of time. So we are actually capturing CO2 that may come back to CO2 again at the atmosphere or may go down. But there is not only large POC in the, that is sinking, but in the ocean, there is also suspended, what is called suspended POC, which is uh, organic particles of organic carbon, which uh, sink so slowly that you, can, you don't see, see them sinking. So our interest was, are all these bacteria growing there and using the carbon that comes, or they are growing up there and then they sink? Are these bacteria uh, uh, using this organic carbon and, and uh, are they different, the ones that are living around and, and so on? So what was the idea? So these, these or particles in the ocean have a, particularly in the deep ocean, have a large biogeochemical role. But we also know, because there's some people that work on piezophilic bacteria, that's bacteria that can resist high pressures in the deep ocean. And they found that they have a dominant particle attached way of life. And some deep ecotypes, deep ocean ecotypes of common bacteria are known to have a, a way of life that is dominantly particle attached. And there's other things. There's lots of dissolved extracellular enzymes in the deep ocean. And uh, when one thinks about that, imagine that you, you are a bacterium and you, you have produced um, uh, an enzymes to the great organic matter. Would it make sense to throw these enzymes out if you live in, alone in the ocean? It wouldn't make any sense because you would lose all these enzymes that were so expensive to produce and nobody would benefit. So if you produce extracellular enzymes and you release them, then it makes sense that you live with your family with your colleagues that you live all together so that if you don't use these enzymes, at least some one of your family or your friends uses these enzymes. So this made, gave the idea that the most bacteria in the deep ocean should live together and they should be uh, sharing, I mean, together and, and growing like in biofilms on top of, on top of particles. Okay, so we went to look at that. Now, if this was a normal class, I would, I would ask you. Here I will show you two graphs, uh, the different estimates of diversity of free living in blue and particle attached bacteria. Now my question is, please think a second. Would you imagine that the free living bacteria are more diverse than the particle attached bacteria or the other way around? Okay, we cannot, uh, we should have a, a, one of these games to, to both, but we don't have it. So this is what we see. 
So free living bacteria in this batepelagic ocean were more diverse than um, particle attached bacteria. Now, the following question. I will come back to this question later on. Following question. Are the bacteria, have, is the phylogenetic diversity of these bacteria, that is, how diverse, not diverse in, in terms of different amounts of different bacteria, but these different bacteria, how different among them are? And this is what we measure here. Well, this is phylogenetic diversity here. And the, the real the real measures is this one are these ones, the phylogenetic diversity div divided by the richness, which is how diverse they are. Can you think of a an answer for that? Okay, indeed, the, the part bacteria living on particles are more diverse among them, so there is less bacteria. There are less different types of bacteria but each one of them is more different from the others phylogenetically. They are far away, farther away. So they come from the very different groups. Okay, good. So which are these bacteria? Well, here you have the free living ones, Tau Marchiota, Marine Group 1, SAR324, which is a member of the Alta Protobacteria, Alteromonas, so on, so on. And those are the ones of the particle attach, which you can see some are in common, Alteromonas, some others are not common. So in fact, the first most abundant in the deep ocean appears, this is the different, uh, the different basins of the, of the world's oceans. And you can see in blue, as always, the free living in red, as always, the particle attached. You can see that more or less, they follow about the same relationship, except at this particular basin. However, if you go to the second one, which is a Crenarchiata, you see that this one is basically in the free living fraction, not in the attached. Let's go to the third one. Well, the third one, which is an actinobacteria, <coughs> appeared in the particle attached fraction, but not in all basins, only in some of the basins. And the fourth one, this one appeared in some of the basins, but in both uh, uh, fractions. Okay, so one of my students did this very nice thing, which is how as you move with the ship uh, around the ocean, you can see how the different groups change their relative abundances. This is the abundance, this is the most abundant, the, last, the least abundant, and you can see that they start uh, changing and they, are, they look different, but the most abundant is always the same one in both fractions. Now we are in the Pacific and we go back in the Pacific and okay, so, and you can see, I mean, that doesn't tell anything, but you will agree with me that it's funny and, and nice looking anyway. So then the second question that, that we ask is, are they all growing at the similar? So we look at the DNA and the RNA. And here we have the free living in blue. And here we have the particle attached. Those are different groups. And you can see that some groups are more abundant in the DNA fraction than in the RNA fraction, meaning that they are more present than active. And these are, for example, acetobacteria, cyanobacteria, which is logical because in the deep ocean, cyanobacteria should not be doing too much of a photosynthesis, I would say, and so on and so on. Other groups are the contrary, like this one, but this is very strange, or delta proteobacteria, which is more abundant in the RNA fraction. So, so it's more uh, active than abundant, relatively than abundant. If we go to the free living fraction, those are Uriarchiota and Taumarchiota are present in the free, li uh, free living fraction, but they don't seem to be very active. And these three groups like beta, beta proteobacteria, bacteroidetes, seem to be more active than present in the deep ocean. So they are, they have different rates of uh, being pre uh, active and present. And this is one of these multi-dimension uh, graphs in which each point is one community. And here we put together that these are the free living bacteria, but the, the DNA. And here in this blue, where is it? Here, this blue here is the active bacteria in the free living fraction. You can see that they are very different. Some, the very separated, the, the two communities are very part of, 
separated. However, in the particle attached, they are more close together, the present and the active. And the interesting thing here is that these three groups are more or less together, while this group is separated. So one can think, one hypothesis or way of thinking about this is that maybe the organisms that we see in the free living fraction are not really a fair representation of the active community in the free living fraction. This, is, this active community in the free living fraction, it's actually quite similar to the uh, particle attached communities. And there is a theory that was put forward many years ago that was called the baby machine. In this th theory, the, the, the author said that the particle has bacteria growing on them and every once in a while, some of these bacteria are released. And they, if they can survive finding another particle, then they will continue living. If they not, cannot survive outside, well, they simply die, die out, become inactive, uh, move from the RNA fraction to the dominantly DNA fraction. So the baby machine, good. So a little bit of, um, of this phylogeny thing. Look, uh, Guillaume, my student, uh, was very good with, uh, with uh, R. So he put together this figure. In this figure, he put together all the, the different bacteria that we found in all these samples. And then in these lines here, the blue ones are the ones that are dominant in the free living and the red ones in the particle attached. When we were looking at this graph, which it was very nice and, and for a while it was a candidate to his uh, thesis cover. So we, we, we saw that there were groups like, look at this group here. This is a whole phylogenetic group that is only blue. Sorry, blue is that one. The third one is another story. That's dominantly blue. There's not, none of them in the particle attached. And here we have, have another whole phylogenetic group that is in the red and it's almost not in the blue. So then we decided that we wanted to know how much, uh, uh, how many much relationship there was between phylogeny and habitat. And this is uh, what we did. So we, we plot, we define it, uh, what we call the particle association niche value. This uh, value is one, if one O2, one organism is found only in particles. And it's zero, if this organism is never found in particles and uh, an intermediate value if uh, sometimes it's in particles, sometimes it's not in particles. Uh, this is a comparison between the real data and uh, random data generated at random, could be like that, and it's not like that. So we, we see that some bacteria, quite a lot of bacteria are, uh, are never in particles, quite a lot are always in particles. Okay, and then this is a bit difficult to, to understand, but, but I will try to, to walk through. So what he did is he measured for, for each bacteria, the phylogenetic distance to all other bacteria. And this value of particle attachment, also the distance to this other bacteria. And the more different the bacteria are, the more phylogenetically separated these bacteria are, one should expect that the more difference is this different is this particle attached value. And in fact, that's what happens up to a point where this breaks down and there's nothing, there's no more relationship. So this line actually tells you whether the particle attachment is something that all organisms of the same domain have in common or not. And, and if they are above the particle, it means that they don't have it in common. If it's below the line, it means that they do have it in common. And you can see that for organisms of the same domain, it's not true. Not all archaea are particle attached, not all archaea are free living. The same for the phyla. But when you get into class, a few classes don't follow this rule, but most of the classes and most of the orders and basically most of the families and most of the genus, there is a relationship between the, the being of that group and having the same uh, uh, niche in that same. Okay. Another way of showing that this is um, uh, one of these multi-dimensional representation. 
here we saw that when we put all the communities, we clearly separate the free living, which are those, the blue ones, from the particle attached. And, uh, and then what we did is we used that to plot on top the abundance of the different organisms of the, of the group. And you, you can see that this one, the Ferribacteris, all, most of them follow in the blue area. However, these firmicutes, most of them follow in the particle attached, fall on the, the particle attached. Actinobacteria seem to have some that fall here and others that fall here. And uh, the same with every Uri archaeota node, our free living, plankton is set as our particle attached, and so on and so on. So when we look at this thing, we see that some groups are particle attached, the red ones, some groups are free living, the blue ones, and some groups are in the middle. But then you get into the group, you separate two subgroups of this group, and you can see that you have one group that's particle attached and another group that's free living. Okay. So there was quite a lot of, uh, of uh, phylogen phylogenetic signal in that specific uh, ecological trait, or ecological characteristic of these organisms. We also did some metagenomics. I, I will go, not go very far into that, but, but uh, when we look at the metagenomes of all these samples, we found that in the free living fraction, about 40% of the genes were novel, so had not been described by Tara Oceans and other of these expeditions. And in the particle attached fraction, we found it, it changed a lot, but sometimes it was 20%, but many times it was about 80%, specifically in the Indian Ocean. So the Indian Ocean is less explored than the Atlantic or the Pacific, okay? We also found that not all genes were important in all fractions. As you can see, this is a free living gene. This is a, not a, a particle attached fraction and not everywhere. So this particular gene was only present in the Indian Ocean and a little bit in the Atlantic. And, uh, and just for fun, we, we draw these things. I don't know if you know this. this uh, there's an app where you can put the genes that you find and it will draw you this, this nice uh, molecular map or, 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 or genetic mar map. It's just to show you, I'm gonna change from free living to particle attach. And you can see, this is the free living. This is the particle attach. This is the free living, the particle attach. The free living, the particle attach. And you can see how different these communities are, okay? One of the things that we found enriching particles was inorganic carbon fixation in the dark ocean. You can see lots of these genes. This is the red samples, which are the particle attached. The blue samples are the free living. And you can see that all these functions were particularly expressed in, oh, sorry, present, because this was only in metagenomes in the particle attached, not in the free living, so. And there were also mosaics of, of areas where uh, we found uh, these are the different areas. And you can see that some genes were only in one area or these ones were only in this area and so on and so on and not everywhere. Well, that was the same. I'm not gonna get into details with that. Let me see the timing, oops. Okay, so after we did this, uh, this work, we decided that this was kind of a simplistic, no? because you separate particles from free living, but, but particles are a whole wall. So can we get farther into, into that? So we figured out a way of separating the particles and it was as simple as putting together different filters and running the sample through all of them. So we had 0.2 microns, 0.8 microns, three microns, five microns, 10 microns, 20 microns, 200 microns. And we separated the uh, organisms in the different filters and we went to look at how they look like. Just to give you an idea, this was done in the coast, Northwestern Mediterranean and at the coast. It's quite an oligotrophic area. And we found that all, uh, about 8% of the cells were retained by 0.8 micron. And only 0.2% of the cells were larger than three microns and only 0.1% of the cells were larger than 10 microns. So just to give you an idea that, because when we compare community compositions, we sometimes forget 
that some community compositions are not very abundant as compared to other community compositions, communities which are much more abundant, like for example, this one or the, the rest, which is 90, 92 percent of the cells were actually collected in this filter. Okay, so these are the different sizes and this is the diversity. Now I'm asking you again to think what will we see here? Will we see that the particles have more diverse, sorry, the free living have more diversity than the particles or the other way around? Will it be continuous or it will be like uh, jumpy? Think about that. You have your own hypothesis, ready, set, go. That's what we found. So we found that actually the diversity was increasing with the size of the filter in the coastal Mediterranean. So it's completely different from the Bathy Pelagic. Okay. Uh, <coughs> As you can see, the 10 and 20 microns were pretty similar. The three and five microns were similar, but the other two fractions were quite different among them. This is another rep representation to tell you not only the diversity, but also the evenness of these communities. This is the abundance of the different organisms, and this is the rank. So the most abundance is played the, the first, the most abundant is here, and the least abundant is here. So if it's very steep, this curve, it means that the community is dominated, more dominated by few, fewer group organisms. If the, the, the slope is less steep, it means that there, there are more or less, uh, is more or less even among the different organisms their, present, their presence in the community. And you can see that there is a gradient from the 0.2 here to the larger one here. So the, 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 the free living is the one that has uh, less uh, evenness. And this is some groups, just to show you here, sorry, the filters is one, two, three, four, five, six, but those is the, the, this is 0 0.2, 0 0.8, and so on and so on. You can see, for example, Sinecococcus were found here, which it makes sense because they tend to have one micron. So it wouldn't make sense that they are present below 0.8. Uh, but the, most of them, they were in this filter. Sari 11, however, which is a small bacteria, were all present here. And here you have another small bacteria, Sar 116. And you have other bacteria like Berumicoria or Planktomycetes or Protobacteriales, planktomycetes, which were more common in the larger size fractions. And, uh, and you can actually plot from 0 0.2 to, to the largest filter, uh, do a map like that in which you can separate those that are present, especially in the lower and the smaller filters, those that are in the smallest filters, but not in the very small and the uh, smallest of all filters, Another group which are everywhere and there's no real, no real difference. And another group that clearly are more abundant in the larger size fractions. And when you do that every month during a year or two, you see that different fractions are determined by different factors. Temperature is everywhere because in day length, because this is a seasonal cycle, but you can see phosphorus appears in the smallest fractions. And, and turbulence or transparency measured by the Secchi disk is present in the largest size fraction. So there are different factors determining the, the organism living in the smallest fraction and the organisms living in the largest fractions. And uh, still another thing which is pretty funny, which is that some organisms, this, each color is a one month of the year, and, uh, and uh, these are the different fractions. So this is the smallest one and it goes this way until the largest one. And you can see that some organisms like this one or this one always have the same, basically the same pattern. Rhodobacterial is a bit more here than in the other fractions. Sinecococcus larger, uh, more present here than in the other fraction. However, other organisms change. Like for example, SAR-11, you can see that one month they are dominant here another month they are dominant here, and most of the months are dominant here. And this group, Planktomycetes, is a, a, every month is a different story, as you can see in here, okay? 
So we, we even invented a, 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 a number to, to qualify whether they were a pattern like that or a pattern like that. And this is the number that they were figured out. Okay, and, and I'm going to the last part. And in this last part, uh, we were, again, I'm gonna go back for, let's forget about uh, the coastal Mediterranean and we go back to this uh, Malaspina cruise, to this uh, Batipelagic cruise. In this cruise, as I told you, we, we, were, we are very interested in, in the particles that are generated in the surface ocean. These particles sink and as they sink, they might be degraded by bacteria. Some of these particles sink uh, fast, don't sink at all, or they don't, they don't sink at the rate that we can, at the rate that we can easily measure them. And we were interested in, in this bacteria here. Are these bacteria there? And as soon as the particle arrives, they jump onto them and they weigh them? Or they, these bacteria are actually here? They colonize the particle and they travel down with the particle and keep degrading the particle as it goes down. And uh, uh, to do that, we in this cruise, we took uh, three, six, eight samples in these areas that you can see in the Atlantic, the Pacific, the Indian Ocean, and around Australia. And what we did is that at different depths in the surface, at the depth of the maximum chlorophyll, uh, which is about here is about 100 meters or so in the ocean, in the mesopelagic and in the batipelagic. Mesopelagic is between 200 and 1000 meters, batipelagic above or below, because it's going down uh, 1000 meters. And we did the same approach. So we separated them into one, two, three, four, and five size fractions. And then what we did is that we labeled or we stain or we painted in yellow the otus, the organisms, if they were first found in the surface, we imagine that the flow is this directional, it goes from here to here. In green, if they are found, they are not found here in the surface, but they are found in the DCM. In blue, if they are not found here, nor here, but they are found first in the mesopelagic, and in dark blue, if they are first found in the batipelagic. This is the number of organisms. And this is the number of, or the, the total, or the contribution of sequences to the total. As you can see, most of the organisms that we found in the batipelagic were already there in the surface. And it's not only the number of organisms, it's also their contribution to the community. So about 85% of the deep ocean community was already there in the surface. This would mean that the particles are colonized here and they go down and the organisms, only a few organisms come and jump over the particles as they go down, okay? Then we look at which were these organisms that were actually not that uh, that acted as seeds. Seeds meaning organisms that were in the surface, not very abundant in the surface, but that that became very abundant in the deep. And uh, for example, here here is more more obvious. These organisms were only five percent in the surface, but end up being thirty percent in the deep. Or these organisms here were like uh, ten percent in the surface and sixty percent in the deep. So we did that for each, uh, each station. And the only thing I would like you to see is the colors here. And uh, the question is, do they look alike? No. So different organisms, organisms were colonizing the particles in different stations in different parts of the ocean. And uh, then we look at what determine these, these uh, organisms. In the, in the different parts. So we, we took, this is the mantle correlation is a correlation between um, a matrix of environmental data and the matrix of community composition. So you have for each sample, you have all sorts of environmental data and all sorts of organisms and you do a correlation. And we found that for the large size fractions, there was 
large groups of positive correlations with environmental data and with the community composition of the phytoplankton at the surface. However, for the small size fractions, there was very few of these correlations. Okay. So this would mean that the, 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 um, the large size fractions reflect what happens in the ocean at the surface. So all the gradients that we see, you see here that chlorophyll here was very low, but here was very high. Primary production was very high here, uh, smaller here and very low here. So this means that they are actually reflecting this. And another way of, of showing that, this is a bit complicated, but I walk you through, is this is the comparison between the similarity in the community at the surface and at the, at the bottom, at the body plasic, and at diff, with the different filters, so the smallest in blue and the largest in red. And this is the correlation with the primary production of the, of the station or the chlorophyll of the station. And you can see that the blue ones are never positively correlated. The only po the, the significant correlations are those with the star here. So the, the surface, the, the smallest fractions are never, never, never correlated. The largest fractions are correlated. So this means that the batipelagic communities on particles are correlated to ha what happens in the surface. So whatever happens in the surface, it is reflected down. So the bacteria in the bottom in the particles, not in the free living, are a function of what happens on the, on the surface. Okay, so then I'm finishing. I only have two things. We figure out the hypothesis. And the hypothesis is if there is low carbon flux, so very little of the carbon actually goes down, and that means that most of the CO2 goes back to the atmosphere, then the community composition of particles at the surface and the community composition of particles in the deep ocean will be very different. These, the color spheres are supposed to be different. You don't even see them, but they are supposed to be different. However, if the flow is very fast, then the particles in the surface and the particles in the deep will have the same bacterial communities. And then the CO2 flux or return to the atmosphere would be very low. This situation would be a situation of carbon sequestration to the deep ocean. This situation will not be, okay? And, uh, and now, of course, if you work uh, in, on bacteria like we do, and, and you think, hey, we can take samples, have an automatic machine on board that measures community composition, and in five minutes, we have an estimate of the carbon flux. Okay, let's try it. So what we do did was, uh, I mean, measuring particle flux is not easy. People sometimes deploy sediment traps. The sediment trap is just a bottle that you put open, that you put at the depth and you uh, go back a few days or a week uh, or maybe a month later and look how many particles sedimented. But the rate of particle sedimentation is, uh, they have plenty of problems and, uh, and, uh, and uh, some people like them, some people don't like it at all. We also have satellite mod models. The satellite models, of course, are as good Satellite measures chlorophyll in the surface and the estimation of particle sinking or POC flux from the satellite mod model is as good as the data that has been used to create. But there's another way of doing that, which is the thorium uranium. The whole idea here, which for us biologists, it sounds like, uh, like uh, bizarre, is that there is a, an org a, a compound which is called uranium-238 which is the wall is full of that uranium because it was a spread during the, the atomic bombs, tests and, and the ones that were used in the war. This decomposes into thorium, but with the difference, uranium is not at, does not attach to particles, does not attach to anything, nobody uses it. So particle profile of uranium tends to be like that. However, thorium, attaches to particles. 
So the, the plot of uranium, sometimes uh, of thorium, sometimes is like that. And uh, uh, you actually calculate the, the, how much thorium should there be according to uranium and, and how many, how much of it is there and calculate the deficit of thorium. So the physicists calculate in the oceanographers, not us, calculate the POC flux using the thorium deficit and a, cal a calibration, uh, um, a calibration uh, curve. So we thought, well, let's try to go to a cruise where they do this and we do this uh, community composition on particles of the, of the, of the bacteria. And we, we managed to go to these two cruises, well, one cruise in these two Polynias, south of Australia in the Antarctic. And this is what we found. This is the dissimilarity between the surface community and the deep community at 0 0.2, 0 0.8, and 53 microns. And this is a thorium flux. You can see that when the thorium flux is very large, so particles actually go very fast down, the, uh, uh, the communities with, I mean, dissimilarity. So it means here are different, here are similar, okay? So the communities are more similar. When the thorium flux is a small, so there's less uh, sedimentation of particles, the communities are very much different than one of the largest size fraction. The other don't make a relationship. Of course, this is only three points because taking this takes a while, but I think we have a, a, nice, a nice idea here that uh, we, we hope to implement. Well, we are implementing now, getting more samples and measuring more. So what did I say? Well, I say that most people that work in, in the ocean use one filter to separate free living from attached particles. And people use either 0.8 or 3.5 microns. That in the Batipelagic ocean free living communities are more diverse than attached, yet some groups appear quite inactive. The genomes of particle attached or free living communities are very distinct. The attachment lifestyle and the free living lifestyle appears to be quite conserved phylogenetically at the approximately class level. If we move away from this one dichotomy of free living particle associated using various size fractions, this lets us know patterns of diversity with size and groups associated to different sizes. So we get a, a picture that's more richer, more, uh, more uh, informative than the one we obtain only with this. And we also saw that the, what happens in the Batipelagic does not happen in the surface ocean. As I say, in the coastal ocean, larger sizes, more diversity, which is different than what we saw here. Deep ocean particles seem to be colonized at the surface. And the more stuff sinks, the more similar the particle attached communities from the surface and the bottom of the ocean. And uh, that would be everything. This is how we were in the Malaspina cruise. Some were very happily seeing birds, others working, and some having problems with other, of other styles, as you can see here, at looking at the microbes and so on. So this is everything we can, uh, what do I do now? Let me see the camera.